all of these cardiomyopathies, there is a problem intrinsic to the contractile element of the heart, the myocyte. The name tells us that there is some disease intrinsic to the heart muscle itself. So we have cardio, meaning heart, myo, meaning muscle, and then pathy, meaning some sort of disease, pathology, right? The disease needs to be thought about in an easy way. The easy way to think about something like dilated cardiomyopathy is that there is damage to the myocytes that leads to a drop in contractility, which is called systolic dysfunction. The heart muscle cells are damaged, and this myocyte degeneration is a big problem because when you lose the strongest element of your heart that's responsible for contracting and pushing blood out, you begin to accumulate blood inside the chamber because you cannot pump it out. The heart will respond in what way? It'll respond by adding sarcomeres in series so that ventricle can stretch. Now what does that even mean and why does the heart do it? Our friend Laplace is back to save the day. The law of Laplace is an easy way to conceptualize what is going on. So let's draw our left ventricle. Remember the law of Laplace is given by this equation where the pressure within the chamber is denoted by P, the wall thickness is denoted by this sweet little N, and then the radius is obviously R, and the wall tension is denoted by sigma. So the law of Laplace basically says that wall tension is what we're worried about, right? So if we increase the pressure in the ventricle, we increase wall tension. If we increase the radius, we increase wall tension. If we increase the wall thickness, though, we decrease the wall tension. And that's exactly how the heart compensates. It follows physics. It doesn't have a brain. It doesn't think. It just does what the law of nature tells it to do. The law of Laplace tells us that an increase in wall tension, which is this, sigma, can be due to an increase in ventricular pressure or radius. Perfect. It says it right here. Or due to a decrease in wall thickness. So in the situation of dilated cardiomyopathy, we're going to be increasing the radius significantly because we're losing the ability of our myocytes to contract and keep that chamber nice and tight together. So the radius will go up and so will the pressure because we are not able to pump blood out of the ventricle and volume is accumulating. Remember, compliance is volume and pressure, right? So if you increase your volume really fast and you can't get it out, then you're going to accumulate pressure. So what is our job? Well, we want to add sarcomeres in series, like so, one on the end of the other. And this helps us distend our chamber to increase our compliance so that that volume does not increase the pressure within the chamber so fast. Even though our heart does not like the situation one bit, because this increased volume overload from decreased systolic ejection leads to an increase in our radius, so obviously this segment will come out, which creates significant increases in wall tension. Wall tension is bad. It creates an increased oxygen demand for the myocytes that are still alive. Our heart does not like this, but it's going to do what it has to to survive. It's going to add sarcomeres in series, just like this, to increase the wall thickness and alleviate some of the tension, right? So, our heart is going to stretch out, and we're adding muscle to increase the thickness of the wall. This is why hearts of dilated cardiomyopathy are humongous and two to three times larger than you would expect for a normal heart. We need to know the causes so when our patient comes in, we can tell them why their heart is now a huge, thick balloon. Most of the time, we have no idea, which is unfortunate because patients hate hearing the term idiopathic cardiomyopathy. I'm sorry, we don't know why your heart is a large Walmart bag. But we'd love to get you all worked up and tell you everything we can about it. Obviously, idiopathic cardiomyopathy is not going to be a fair game question on your step one exam. It requires no thinking of the underlying etiology. They might ask you what is the most common cause for dilated cardiomyopathy, and that still is not a fair game question. So idiopathic is one of the causes, but that's not what they're going to ask you. They're going to ask you a lot of the high yield ones that tie in some biochemistry, for example ethanol use, alcohol abuse, wet beriberi. You think this is high yield? Of course it is because right now you're struggling to think back towards that biochemistry section and you're like, what exactly are those about? How does it relate to biochemistry? And well, I looked back there and I'm about to tell you, we're about to both learn this again. Both alcohol and beriberi are conditions in which we have deprived the myocytes, mitochondria of thiamine. 
which we know is crucial for the function of pyruvate dehydrogenase. Without thiamine, you cannot make sufficient enough ATP because you're not making your pyruvate dehydrogenase work very well. You need ATP to keep those myocytes contracting. In addition to that, acetaldehyde, which is one of the breakdown products of ethanol, is a direct mitochondrial toxin. So it blasts your mitochondria and then they die. Not only is that bad, but you've disrupted the connection that cytochrome C has to the inner mitochondrial membrane. Remember, cytochrome C is attached to the inner mitochondrial membrane, and if you liberate it, you set off the apoptotic pathway. What are some other causes of dilated cardiomyopathy? How about Coxsackie B virus? Chagas disease? These are infectious etiologies of dilated cardiomyopathy. There is direct infiltration of the myocyte. Direct. Remember that. This is a virus. Where do viruses replicate? Within the cell. So they're in the myocyte replicating and causing damage by triggering an immune-mediated attack on these myocytes. Now what about Chagas disease? First of all, what is it caused by? Trypanosoma cruzi, right? These release a neurotoxin that directly damages the specialized conduction myofibrils within the heart. What are some other etiologies? Cocaine, doxorubicin, and hemochromatosis. All of these are chemical-induced toxicities on myocytes. Cocaine and the DNA intercalating agent doxorubicin are incredibly toxic compounds. One is really fun, the other is not. Either way, they both directly damage the mitochondrial membrane within the myocytes. So again, this is another theme of mitochondrial damage. The excessive iron deposition that occurs in hemochromatosis leads to the generation of intramyocyte, so within the myocyte, reactive oxygen species. How does that happen? The Fenton reaction. Remember this? We know that hydroxyl radicals are produced, such as OH negative. They just go around piling up, and what happens is that these bad boys pull hydrogens off of places where they shouldn't, such as DNA, phospholipids, and amino acids. All of these are structures that are very important for the structural integrity and functioning of a cell. Can't function without your DNA, lose your integrity of membranes without properly functioning phospholipids, and amino acids are important for protein synthesis. So the dilated cardiomyopathy in pregnancy is a particularly high yield one because it's kind of on its own. It doesn't really fit into any of these other groups of chemical induced or infectious process or idiopathic. The dilated cardiomyopathy in pregnancy is due to an increase in significant plasma volume. Remember, that is one of the things that happens during pregnancy. You have to have enough blood for two people. So you expand your plasma volume compartment. This can volume overload the heart, so it stretches the heart chambers to the point that there is significant myocyte damage. All of these, the chemical induced, the viral, the pregnancy, the idiopathic, lead to an eventual balloon-like dilatation of the heart, which you can see on chest x-ray. So just look at this radiograph. First of all, this person has a pacemaker, so that's kind of a giveaway. But don't even worry about these wires or the pacemaker. What we need to appreciate is the balloon-like explosion that this heart looks like. Look at this. This is a big heart. Now what are we going to hear? So let's say we didn't jump straight to our imaging like we'd like to because we don't want to perform a physical exam because that's hard. So much easier just to look at the radiograph, right? Of course, and that's why test examiners will incorporate physical exam findings to test your knowledge. So we can hear an S3 heart sound because the hypocontractile heart accumulates blood within that left ventricle. The S3 heart sound is from turbulent flow that occurs when the incoming blood splashes against blood that is collecting in the left ventricle because it was not pushed up and out into the ventricular outflow tract from the previous contraction. So think about it. Here's your mitral valve, and here's your big, huge left ventricle. And there's some baseline blood in there, more than we usually have. Remember, we usually have some blood left in there. But this is much more than normal. And when the new blood comes in, it makes that noise. When it hits, causes vibrations. And then that is the S3 that you can auscultate with your stethoscope. The treatment for this should be based around increased ability of the heart to contract. 
that is increasing inotropy and decreasing the volume that is delivered to the chamber because the problem here is low contractility and volume overload. Great ways to do this to initiate treatment are to decrease your sodium intake because water follows sodium and you decrease sodium, you decrease your intravascular volume. So how do we do that? Well, we give them diuretics such as the loop diuretic furosemide which inhibits the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter in the ascending loop of Henle and by blocking the renin angiotensin aldosterone system with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB if they're not tolerant to an ACE inhibitor because they can develop angioedema and cough. Now why is the RAS system activated in these patients anyways? There is poor forward perfusion of all organs including the kidneys. The kidney's job is to filter the blood and also to maintain blood pressure. Even though they're a great organ, they are stubborn. They think that their job is the most important. They don't understand that we have dilated cardiomyopathy. All they say is that we are not getting enough blood in our afferent arterial and they activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system in addition to the sympathetic nervous system to help regulate our blood pressure. We need to use an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker to prevent the progression of heart failure because the juxta glomerular cells that release renin also have beta adrenergic B1 receptors on them. So a beta blocker allows us to prevent beta adrenergic signaling directly on the heart and also blocks one of the effector cells responsible for continued activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. If things really deteriorate and there's such a low contractile force you can put them on an implantable cardioverter defibrillator, which is known as an ICD. Again, implantable cardioverter defibrillator. If they're really bad, you just go straight to heart transplant, which would be the last step.